Good afternoon, perhaps good morning for some or even good evening for others. And welcome to this edition of the Program on Negotiations book series. Today, PON is delighted to host Joshua Weiss, who will be speaking to us about his new book, The Book of Real World Negotiations, Successful Strategies from Business, Government, and Daily Life. My name is Nicole Bryant, and I am the Managing Director of the Program on Negotiation at Harvard Law School. The Program on Negotiation is a consortium between Harvard University, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Tufts University. At PON, we work to help people solve problems, build successful relationships, and deal productively with conflict. And we are convinced that learning how to negotiate more effectively will help our learners and practitioners in their work, in their communities, and in their personal lives. To that end, we are delighted to bring a series of virtual events such as this one to our community of scholars, practitioners, and friends. Today's participants come from all over the world as we start to see in the chat, and we are honored that you have chosen to spend this hour with us. After Josh's presentation, there will be time for discussion and we will ask that you pose your questions through the Q&A function of the Zoom. Of course, if you have any comments, you're always welcome to leave them in the chat. This talk is being recorded and we will make it available along with the PowerPoint slides used in a couple of days on the PON website. I would like to thank the PON staff members, um, especially Diane Long and Anna Cheng for their help in organizing this event today. And now I'm happy to introduce today's presenter. Joshua Weiss is the co-founder with William Urey of the Global Negotiation Initiative at Harvard University and a senior fellow of the Harvard Negotiation Project. He's also the director and creator of a Master of Science degree in Leadership and Negotiation at Bay Path University. Josh is a researcher, educator, educator, and consultant to organizations both public and private. He has been widely recognized as the author and creator of numerous books, ebooks, and podcasts. The Book of Real World Negotiations is Josh's latest achievement, and this work highlights some of the most important principles of negotiation, but not just through theory, but actually uh, an analysis of a series of real life cases. And in this way, Josh invites readers to uh, live in these multiple stories of negotiation and highlights the most important lessons for all of us to remember along the way. So on behalf of the PUN community, I am delighted to welcome Josh Weiss and uh, to hand over my virtual Zoom microphone to him now. Thank you so much, Nicole. Very much appreciate the, the lovely introduction and, and thank you to everybody for taking time out of your day to join in a bit. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that you can see uh, some slides today. Does that work for everybody? Nicole, is that okay? Okay, great. So um, <clears throat> as Nicole mentioned, this is a, a new book that I had published in August and um, I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, why the focus in a moment. Um, but what I thought I would do is actually dive right into a story that, uh, that I have come to really enjoy sharing uh, because I think it's rife with all kinds of interesting lessons. So the story is actually from a colleague of mine uh, that happened a few years ago. And the story goes like this. So this was a negotiation between two companies that were approximately the same size around a mer potential merger. And each side had agreed to have uh, three negotiators in the room. And my colleague was um, going to be sitting in the room and, and, and giving her team advice during the, the sessions. Um, so basically what ended up happening is they went through their preparation and um, they thought they had a very good plan for how the negotiation would unfold. Um, and generally speaking, the companies were um, similar in size and scope and and power. And so they thought, you know, it would be a, a negotiation among equals, if you will. Uh, however, things turned out a little bit differently. So when the negotiation began, the lead negotiator for the other side, who we'll call Oliver, uh, began with a very uh, demanding approach. In fact, he laid everything on the table, essentially saying that this is, we've done our analysis, uh, we know what this deal should look like. And um, we're pretty much putting it on the table and it's a take it or leave it kind of thing. And he did so in a very uh, pedantic um, manner. Uh, he was very aggressive in his approach. And then after he laid that all out, he sort of leaned back and said, well, and our team 
or the team of this, my, my colleague basically sort of said, look, uh, this is not exactly how we thought this process would unfold. And so we'd like to kind of talk about doing this differently. And Oliver said, I'm not interested in doing it differently. You know, this is what we're offering. You have to decide whether you want to take this or not. Again, the team on my colleague's side tried to push again, not interested. And finally, Oliver leaned and he said, I'm, I'm running out of patience. Either you're going to take it or I'm leaving. And they said, if this is the deal that's on the table, you know, we just can't make that work. So he angrily got up and started jamming his papers into his briefcase. And his two colleagues um, seemed a bit surprised at his behavior um, from the beginning, um, but didn't say a whole lot. And as they noticed him jamming his papers in, they sort of decided, OK, we better pack up as well, because I guess we're leaving. <laughs> and um, Oliver then got up, didn't wait for his colleagues, and opened the door, slammed it behind him, and that appeared to be it. However, the problem was that Oliver had not walked out the door, but actually gone into a walk-in closet. And everybody knew that he was in the walk-in closet. Now, what made this story sort of even more funny was Oliver stayed in the closet for 15 seconds, 30 seconds, and everybody kept looking at the door, wondering whether he was gonna come out. Eventually, it probably seemed like forever for Oliver, uh, he showed, sort of sheepishly you know, stuck his head back out uh, and didn't really know what to do. But during that time, after my colleague's friends and the, the, the negotiators that she was working with got composed themselves because they were all laughing, um, they leaned over to the other side, to the other remaining two negotiators who were still there packing up. And they said, hey, um, you know, we have a way we think we can do this. Are you guys interested in hearing that out? Um, obviously your colleague wasn't, but are you? And they said, well, what do you have in mind? And that actually led to a different process altogether uh, where they were able to actually come up with an agreement. Um, and during the time when they were engaging in that negotiation, Oliver sort of slinked back to the table and was relegated to the side uh, and didn't have much of a role going forward. And what I, you know, what I love about this story is that, um, of course, you know, um, emotions can overwhelm people. And I think we have to really understand ourselves, but um, there's also this element of uh, surprise and incomplete information and the strange twists and turns that arise in negotiation. As, as one of my colleagues said to me the other day, when you've seen one negotiation, you've seen one negotiation. They're very different. You never know what it is that you're going to get in each situation and you have to be prepared for anything. And in this particular case, um, you know, I think that there are a lot of interesting lessons you can draw your own, which is one of the wonderful things about stories is that I draw my own lessons from this situation uh, and the ability to manage your emotions and to be aligned with your teammates and things like that. Uh, but others, you know, can draw their own as well. So uh, a good lesson there for all of us to kind of think a little bit about. Let me just sort of pull back for one second and tell you a little bit about why I wrote this book. Um, so. Back in 1995, I actually started working at the program on negotiation, and uh, I had the pleasure of going to faculty dinners. And it was really interesting as a young, younger person than I am today, for sure. Um, I would listen to the faculty and other folks associated with the program on negotiation talk about the situations that they were in, the consulting roles, the negotiations they were involved in, and they were the stories were fascinating. And that's where I really learned what effective negotiation looks like and really feels like. And um, I kept thinking to myself, you know, someday I'd really like to write a book of these real world stories because it's easy to argue with theories and concepts and ideas, but when something happens in real life, it's very difficult to, um, and because it's obviously transpired. And it really got me interested in story. And so as I went into this uh, endeavor and writing this book, I really wanted to show people the how-to of negotiation, especially up against difficult um, scenarios and situations, which you know, this book is filled with. Um, and, and so I was really happy when uh, the publisher uh, decided that they wanted to go down this road. My initial problem was that I didn't have 25 cases of my own, so I had to 
sort of start relying on the goodwill of my colleagues. And, you know, sometimes, of course, people don't want to share some of these because of confidentiality purposes and things along those lines. But, but that really wasn't an issue, as I found, because we could change the names and, and things along those lines to help protect people. It was really the stories, and it was really how people went about negotiating really difficult issues that, that was so important to me to try to bring to the forefront. So that's why I did this. And, and uh, you know, as part of the process, I've sort of begun to fall in love with the idea of stories and the role of story in negotiation. Um, we all use stories in our negotiations, and yet I don't know how much we think about them from a strategic point of view and how do we really um, use them to their maximal effect. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And in fact, what I want to do to just give you a sense of where we're headed here is to share a couple of cases from the book to give you an idea of, of what some of those look like. And then um, I want to move and, and talk a little bit about story and, and essentially what are some of the key ways that you can use the concept of story um, in your own negotiations to help you to make shifts and transform the conversation. Because I'm learning more and more that stories are actually pivotal in, in negotiation um, for a number of reasons that I'd like to kind of highlight for everybody. So let me start with one of my favorite stories in the book. Um, so this is a story about probably one of the most important questions that I know I get which is how do I negotiate when I'm confronted with a, a power imbalance? Um, you know, do I just throw my hands up and hope that the other side will throw some crumbs my way or what do I do? So this is a story about a company called Interagri who was based in China, but it was jointly held by Chinese and Australian um, members essentially. And Interagri was involved in um, agriculture in the agricultural business and they needed to purchase a particular type of specialized machinery to engage in that work. They had had this machinery for about 15 years and it was finally failing. And there was only one company in all of China called Solantar who made that machine. And Solantar was partly privately owned but also supported in part by the government. And there are, for those of you who don't know, there are a lot of restrictions in terms of what can be done uh, in importing um, goods and things like that into China. And so it's very restrictive. And in essence, Interagri didn't really have a choice. They had to try to deal with Solantar. So when they sat down with Solantar to negotiate this um, arrangement, Solantar pretty much sort of had increased their price tenfold from the last time that, that Interagri had purchased this machinery. And it was just simply not possible for them to pay that amount. It would actually crippled their business. So, um, you know, they, they decided to leave the, the negotiation with Solantar and give more thought to what, is, what it was that they could do, because in essence, they had no BATNA. Um, that was their problem, right? They had one company in all of China, they couldn't import anything. And so they just didn't know what to do. So Interagri brought in a negotiation consultant, a friend of mine, to help them. And um, they talked about the situation and Eventually, he said, well, what's your BATNA? And they said, well, that's the problem. We, we don't have one. And he said, well, that's where we're going to have to obviously focus our attention. And they said, well, OK, well, what is it you're asking us to do? And he said, well, here's what I want you to do. Um, I want you to imagine that Solantar has gone out of business. How are you still going to meet your needs for this machinery? And they looked at him and they thought, this guy's crazy. Like, we already have a difficult problem on our hands. And now you're telling us to imagine that the one entity where we can satisfy our needs, we should imagine that they're gone. Um, so he said, yep, and I'll be back in three days. So let me know what it is that you're going to do. So the procurement team who was in charge of this um, sat there for a little bit, staring at each other, wondering what they were going to do to try to meet this need. And eventually somebody said, look, we better try to start thinking creatively because we're not really sure what we're going to do here. So they started to brainstorm. And at one point, after some ideas came to the forefront, um, somebody said, I wonder if there's another company in China that might own this equipment and might actually be interested in selling to us. The procurement team had no idea. They said, well, why don't you go and see what you can figure out? So he went off and 
he came back the next day and he said, you know what, I think I found a company in Inner, in Inner Mongolia, one of the provinces in China, who actually has this equipment. And I'm going to reach out to them and see if they would at all be interested in selling it. So he did, and he found out that this company had actually decided to um, shift their business away from agriculture and that they did indeed have this machine and were interested in selling it. So they talked to them about what that would look like and et cetera. And it was a few years old, so they knew they could get a reasonable amount of time uh, from the machinery. So they were enthusiastic. In fact, from that point forward, everything changed. When the consultant came back, they explained the situation. And they said, okay, well, now let's go back to Solantar because in an ideal world, you'd rather purchase a new equipment. You don't know what the used one's all about. Um, and let's see what we can do now that you've got a bat, now that you've got something in your back pocket that you can pat. And ultimately, they sat down with Solantar and they got to this place. And Solantar said, we, you know, we've made our offer to you. Are you taking it? And they said, no, we're not. Um, and we do have an alternative. Our preference would be to work this through. Um, but you should know that there's something we can do if we can't. And they explained, it, they decided with the consultant that they actually wanted to share their BATNA so that Solantar understood that they did indeed have one. And so ultimately, Solantar took in the information, they investigated, they found that in fact, they had sold that equipment to this other company. And the outcome was that Solantar came dramatically off of their initial proposal. And so I think there are a number of interesting lessons from this particular case that, I, that are worth highlighting. So the first one is really challenging your perception and, and assumptions about what's possible, especially in the face of power. This is one of those kinds of things that I find a lot when I do consulting work. Um, people will often say they hold all the power. And what I find in negotiation is power is a little bit different than it might be in other realms. Power is something that actually um, comes in many sources. And if you can think creatively and differently about what your sources of power are, then you actually may have a way to influence things differently than you imagine. The second thing is really thinking through deeply and carefully your BATNA. And, um, and to think in particular, is there a way to improve your BATNA? You know, a lot of times we just accept the fact that we've got this poor BATNA and there's really not much we can do, but there are a lot of interesting examples, including this one, where if you seek to try to improve your BATNA, you can, and it helps dramatically. And I think the third lesson that I would take away from this, and I'd actually love to hear in the chat box um, as we go here, lessons that you might have taken away as well. But I think also the role of this outside consultant, you know, it was very valuable in helping to check those assumptions and prepare for a difficult negotiation. So, so that's one story. And, and like I said, I think there's a lot there to unpack and to, to think about. Now, the one thing that I didn't mention about the book is it's broken into three categories. So there's domestic business, US domestic business cases. There's international business cases like this one. And then there are um, cases from government and daily life. And what was really fascinating for me as I did this and then thought when I got to the end of the book, how do I want to conclude this? What do I want to say? What was really interesting was that the lessons from these different cases cut across uh, a number of the cases. And some of the cases that people would normally look at and say, I don't think there's anything I can learn from that because that's not the realm I'm in, actually have some really fascinating um, things to teach us. And that's where I want to go next, which is a crisis negotiation. Now, you know, when I talk to people about negotiations, typically who work in the business world or others, they sort of look at me and think, uh, there's, uh, what am I going to learn from a crisis negotiation? Well, let me tell you this story and, and let's see if you can pull out some lessons because I know I did. And this is a fascinating story. So this story comes from Calgary, Canada. And it's a story about um, two people who were in their 30s, Arthur and Mary a married couple who are also, also methamphetamine addicts um, and were native Canadians. And Arthur and Mary to that point thought that they were having a great life together. But Mary um, inside realized that this lifestyle would ultimately kill them, that they couldn't keep this up. And she desperately wanted to get clean um, and really wanted Arthur to join her. You know, they were very much in love and 
and she cared deeply about him, but he simply refused. He didn't share her perspective. He thought their life was just great. Um, Mary really put down an ultimatum and said, I'm simply not willing to, to kind of keep going down this road. And Arthur just was stalwart in his conviction that his life was just fine. So Mary decided that she was gonna go and check herself into this rehabilitation clinic on the outskirts of Calgary. Um, and Arthur was devastated, but in as much as he was devastated, he was also really angry. And he wanted to show Mary how she had ruined his life. Now, at the time he admitted that he was high on, on methamphetamine, but still there was that disgruntled element to his view of what had happened. And so he had to teach her in his mind, an unforgettable lesson. So um, Arthur went down to his basement or to his garage and uh, found a rope and threw it into his car and drove to um, the rehabilitation clinic where his wife had explained where it was. She had also told him, she had called him from the rehabilitation clinic and said that there was a beautiful tree outside her window and she would love him to come and, and be with her there, et cetera. So he knew that there was a, a tree from which he could hang himself in order to teach her this lesson. So Arthur drove to the rehabilitation clinic, got out, took his rope out and began to climb up the tree and get himself prepared for this. As he was doing so, a, a young man passed by and clearly knew something was up. He said, excuse me, are, is everything okay? Um, in a <laughs> very sort of naive way, I suppose. And Arthur dismissed him and told him to mind his own business. But the young man didn't mind his own business and called 911. And this is where Gary, the crisis negotiator, enters the story. Um, the dispatcher called Gary and said, we need you down here right away. We've got a person who looks like they're uh, going to commit suicide. Um, and we need to understand what's going on here. And we need you to talk them down from the tree. So Gary uh, steamed his way through the city and arrived uh, at dusk. Uh, this was in October. And so Calgary, things are getting quite cold. And Arthur struck up a, or Gary struck up a conversation with Arthur and said, can you tell me what's going on? He said, it's none of your business. And eventually Gary said, you know, friend, what's it going to take for you to come out of this tree. And at first Arthur dismissed him, but Gary persisted. And eventually, um, and, and the first time around, Arthur said, I'm only coming out of the tree in a body bag. Gary, of course, didn't take that answer um, and leave it. So he kept trying and he finally said, there's gotta be some way that we can get you out of the tree. And Arthur finally said, if you can guess my can native Canadian name, I'll come out of the tree. So Gary thought, okay, a breakthrough, but that's an odd request. What am I going to do with this? How am I going to figure this out? And so he said, well, okay, I'm going to need about 10 minutes to give this some thought. So hang on, stay there. I'll be right back. Um, Gary then went to the car, um, called the dispatcher and said, I need you to call Mary and find out what Arthur's native Canadian name is. Um, so he did so. Um, and then a couple minutes later, um, Gary got a call back from the dispatcher saying his native Canadian name was Running Buffalo. So Gary then proceeded to go back to the tree and he said to Arthur, so Arthur, I think that your uh, native Canadian name is Running Buffalo. So immediately when uh, Arthur heard that, he threw the noose from his neck and scurried down the tree. And Gary sort of wrapped him in a blanket and took him over to the ambulance on the scene. And he then said to, he said to Arthur as he was warming up, I've got to ask you, what was behind the desire for me to guess your native Canadian name? And he said, well, you know, I really didn't want to kill myself. I had gotten myself into this situation, but I also couldn't come out of the tree um, as a loser, if you will. I had to find a way to win and at least come down the tree on even par with you so that I could save face. Um, and that was, a, you know, in many ways, a fascinating reply for Gary. He knew there was something there. He knew there was something going on, but he didn't understand exactly what was happening. Um, and so this is such an interesting story because so much of what's going on here has to do with the psychological realm. And, you know, the more that I 
work in the world of negotiation as many of you do, the more I'm, I'm focusing in on this role of psychology and the intangible issues that often drive people. Now, one of the things that Gary told me um, as we were doing this case is that when he does crisis negotiation or hostage negotiations, um, people are expecting Arnold Schwarzenegger, they're expecting somebody with a bullhorn to yell at them, you know, come out or, or else. And he says, what they actually get is Mr. Rogers. And for those of you who don't know who Mr. Rogers is, or who might live overseas, Mr. Rogers is a, was a very gentle man who had a children's TV show in the 70s and 80s. Um, and what, what Gary meant by that was that the whole purpose of their negotiations and his entire approach is wrapped in rapport building. It's wrapped in trying to connect with this person and understand what it is they're going through so that they can you know, have a successful negotiation, which means ending peaceably. Um, and in this case, you know, the idea of the underlying interest and the ability to save face was so very important um, to Arthur. And there were a number of traps that people get themselves into. Um, one of my former colleagues who has since passed away, Jeff Rubin, talked a lot about psychological traps and, and the concept of entrapment, where our own behavior gets us into a place that we can't get out of. And that's really what happened with Arthur. And he needed a way to escape the problem that he had created. And I think the last thing that, that came from this case for, as a lesson um, was really this idea that crisis negotiators and hostage negotiators stay away from advocacy um, and telling the hostage taker or the crisis the person in crisis what to do because people have been telling them what to do their entire life, how they've made a mess of things and how they've been a failure. And instead, get more into inquiry and asking questions to get them to talk to you and share what it is that's important. So all of these things I think are, are really relevant for us um, as negotiators, no matter what realm we're in. So let me use that as a way of kind of shifting just a little bit to the role of story and, and to share a couple of ways in which I think stories can be very helpful for uh, all of us as negotiators um, and, and perhaps you know, give us a chance to sort of think about this strategically. Now, this is a quote that I came across from Vanessa Boris, who's a psychologist who, I, I, and I really think that this is so applicable to negotiation and I'll try to unpack it a little bit here. But as she says, good stories do more than create a sense of connection. They build familiarity and trust and allow the listener to enter the story where they are, making them more open to learning. Good stories can contain multiple meanings, so they're surprisingly economical in conveying complex ideas and graspable ways. So there's a lot in there that I think is interesting. So let me use that as a way of explaining a couple of different um, approaches to using stories in negotiation, and then, and then we'll open it up for questions, comments, etc. So as, as Jimmy Neal Smith says, we're all storytellers. We live in a network of stories. There isn't a stronger connection between people than storytelling. And I think, you know, it's interesting because if you think about how often we go about trying to persuade people in negotiation to see things our way or to go down a road, many of us take a, a logical approach from, you know, putting A and B together and, and producing C. I don't know how many of us tend to think of stories as a really valuable way of persuading the other. But, but I think that stories, you know, and back to what Boris was saying, stories convey lessons and pro provide examples that are really easily relatable. When somebody says to you, um, I've got a story I'd like to share, um, your orientation changes from perhaps maybe being defensive to something else. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but but stories are also truly universal. Um, every place on the planet um, is, you know, uses stories as a way of connecting and, and, and conveying lessons from history. I remember um, I've worked on a project for many years called the Abraham Path Initiative, and it took me to many parts of the Middle East. And I remember being in the, the Sinai Desert um, and sitting around a campfire, and we were trying to work with some Bedouin colleagues. And I remember um, listening to his stories. And he started talking about the story of the biblical Abraham. And the stories that he shared, this man from the Sinai desert, 
were the same stories that I had learned as a kid, as a as somebody who grew up just outside of Boston. And immediately there was a connection because we shared this story um, and, and all its lessons. So there's a really, a really interesting university, universality to stories that I think can also help in your negotiations. And of course, stories are the most common way that people have learned. And stories also tend to transcend learning styles. So um, I think they're easily relatable and people, even if someone is a visual learner um, or you know, learns better by hearing, um, all of those things are encapsulated by stories. The second rule of stories is that they're really easier to recall in tense moments. Um, you know, trying to think of when, when you're feeling anxiety in a negotiation, it's hard to think of theories and concepts that might be helpful at that moment. But if you can recall a story um, that stuck with you from childhood or from, you know, from your studies to understand different kinds of things, those are the kinds of things that you can recall and utilize to, to change the dynamic. And just interestingly enough, Professor Jennifer Aker from Stanford um, in her research found that stories are remembered up to 22 times more than facts alone. So it's just much easier to recall these. Um, and as social psychologist Alex uh, Krotowski explains, stories are memory aids, instruction manuals and moral compasses. It's so it's almost as if we're hardwired to, to remember stories. And so we're, when we are in a difficult situation, when we're anxious in a negotiation, we can freeze up. It happens to all of us. We've all had that experience. But if you can think to yourself, what story could I fall back on if I experience that? That's gonna give you the space and time to emotionally sort of settle and get back to your overall negotiation approach. The third rule of story is the one that I think perhaps is the most surprising to me in terms of the success that I've seen in using this. And it's really a tactic to disarm the other negotiator and to shift the conversation to a more productive realm. So, you know, one of the hardest things that I know many negotiators face is how do I shift from a positional approach to negotiation to a more interest-based approach, more interest-based way of doing things? And part of my answer is increasingly becoming stories. Um, because interestingly enough, stories often come from an outsider's perspective. Even if you're telling a story about yourself, it seems to sort of come um, from somewhere else, at least perceptually, that's how stories are received. And so this helps to shift the other negotiator from that more competitive approach to a more cooperative approach. And I was recently involved in a uh, consulting uh, job with somebody and they were the client was negotiating with a really difficult person who kept stonewalling and and, and simply wouldn't budge at any moment and um, so they brought me in and we started to talk about well how do we get them to shift and again I had been doing more and more on the idea of story and so we talked about is there a story that you could use that would be similar um, you know where you could share with this other person um, what transpired there as a way of moving them. And we thought about it for a while, they, they brainstormed a bit and they, they realized that there was actually a story, a situation that had happened a few years before that they thought would provide enough insight to, um, you know, to help make that shift. So when the, my client went back into the room with this individual, the individual pretty much said, look, um, you know what, we, you know, we're not really getting anywhere unless you've got anything new to say, um, you know, we should probably just stop. And my client said, you know what, before we stop, can I just share a story with you of an example of how I dealt with a similar kind of challenge? And the other person sort of begrudgingly did so. But as he told the story, he noticed that this other person's demeanor began to change. And at one point he said, you know, what, what happened next? And that's when my, my client knew that he sort of had this person engaged. And it turned out that that story what was, was really what was necessary to get this other person to shift and to, um, to see the possibilities. And in, in fact, what the difficult negotiator ultimately said to him was, you know, now I actually think I can see how we could, um, 
do this in a way that would make sense for both of us. Before I just couldn't, but your example and your story really helped to demonstrate that. So instead of continuing to push and continuing to kind of cajole somebody in, in a certain way, you know, that story painted a picture really of what was possible. And, and I think that, so when you're dealing with somebody who is intransigent and very difficult and seems to not want to budge, you know, try to pull out a story because not only will it um, bring forward those things that you're intending, but often other people read in their own lessons and you never know what it is that the other person's going to see in your story that might be helpful. Now, the last thing I want to say about the role of story has to do with you. And again, you know, we've talked a little bit about the importance of psychology when it comes to negotiation. But what I'm finding too is that we have to turn the mirror in our, in, on ourselves and we have to ask ourselves, what's the story that I'm telling myself about this negotiation? And often uh, when we're struggling, it's because the story that we're telling ourselves is actually a destructive one. I can't do this, they'll never do that. And so another way that you can use story is your internal negotiation. So when a story is holding you back, start to think, well, what's a different story that I can tell myself here that's actually gonna help me to approach this negotiation differently? And how can I convey some of that to the other person that I'm dealing with? So all of these uses to me are incredibly valuable and they show that story is really a tool, it's a tactic, it's a skill that, that I think we need to be focusing on more and more in our negotiations. So I'm gonna stop there. I see that uh, we've got a few questions and comments and things like that. And I'd love to have a conversation about all this. So uh, let me turn it back over to Nicole to share what some of those might be. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much, Josh. And thank you to um, all of our participants. We've had almost 450 folks on at any one time uh, during this discussion today. So thank you so much for your energy and please continue to put your questions into the Q&A function and we're gonna be selecting some of them. You can also like other people's questions so that we can see what sort of some of the most popular uh, questions are. So we have a number of questions about um, uh, the creation of this book about also the role of storytelling and uh, as well as uh, uh, general negotiation um, uh, questions. Okay. So um, let's, uh, we'll start with the, the very first question that, that was posed that I think is really interesting, which is in creating this book, Josh, was there a moment where um, you had a, a story that, that surprised you, right? As an experienced uh, negotiator and teaching, a teacher of negotiation where you learn something new from a story that you hadn't been expecting? To be really honest with you, I learned something new from every one of these stories. Mm -hmm. when, when, I would, when I approached folks about sharing their stories and there was an initial discussion, you know, I basically interviewed folks. Um, as I dug into the story more and drafted the chapters and went back to that, um, what I, what I found actually was a lot of surprising things um, that, that I had not considered. Um, you know, and, and in fact, just as, as one example, um, you know, the, the story that I shared with you about Solantar, um, you know, that one was so stunning to me because it, you know, we often talk about how do you try to improve your BATNA, but here was this really amazing example, um, in a scenario when you're dealing with a sole supplier, you know, there's, there may be no more fearful words in negotiation than sole supplier because of the connotations that it means. And yet, um, when, when my colleague was telling me this story, I kept thinking, well, where's he gonna go with this? I mean, it's almost, it really seems like a dead end. Uh, and yet that question that he posed to them of, imagine that company is now gone, was to me, it was a brilliant question, right? And it, and it really got me thinking, you know, about what are the kinds of questions in my own work that I can be asking people that really challenge some of those assumptions. and and the things that might be possible. And, you know, it was interesting, as I was writing the book, I remember being out and I saw somebody I knew and, and I was explaining, she asked me what I was up to. And I said, I'm just, you know, trying to finish writing this book on negotiation. And she said, oh, you know, I think the best negotiations are where everybody leaves the table a little bit unhappy. And I thought that's interesting. Um, and I think there are a lot of those myths out there. And, but what you find with this book, because I was at the end of this book and I said to her, you know, it's quite interesting that you say that because I just did this book of 25 
cases, and I think maybe one or two um, have a scenario where people left with something less than they imagined. In almost all of the others, I think in all of the others, um, pretty much people got what they really wanted. Now, I understand that the world is not, you know, win-win is not always possible, but, but this exploration and mutual gain is. And I think that the cases really help to highlight for people what effective negotiation looks like. And it's so much more about creativity than it is about compromise and all of these other things that have been espoused at, at PON for so many years. You know, they all came uh, shining through in these scenarios. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, and I think that there are, for, for those of us who have had the opportunity to read the book, there are surprising stories for, for, for first time readers also with, you know, interesting, uh, uh, interesting examples. I'm thinking about the, the chapter on Afghanistan and uh, the uh, UNHCR committee who discovered that there were some women being held hostage and sort of how do you negotiate um, that uh, process of needing to, you know, investigate this without disrupting diplomatic tensions um, and making sure that you're not, you know, overstepping, but, but having a sense of urgency as well. So yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Just, no, just on that case, and, and yeah. it, it really is a fascinating situation. Yeah. Um, and, but the one thing I would say is that, you know, when people talk, talk about um, human rights, most of the time they're talking about advocacy, right? They're talking about shining a light and, and, and sort of public shaming. And, and my colleague who was involved in this, she understood that in this particular situation, she had to walk this really delicate line if she wanted to help free these women. That, that really had to be focused more on problem solving. And, and so yeah. it was hard because she had a lot of people putting pressure on her to, you know, to take more of that advocacy oriented approach. But uh, in the end, she realized that, that she wouldn't have gotten anywhere and she certainly wouldn't have saved these women's lives if, if she hadn't taken that problem solving yeah. way of doing things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Josh, we have a number of questions. So you, you've obviously um, discussed a lot how stories can be a useful tool to educate people about negotiation principles, but we have folks asking about how um, stories can be used within the context of the negotiation itself and um, whether there is a way to effectively communicate stories to uh, your, you know, the person on the other side of the table, even when they might be a little resistant. So we have someone saying, I work you know, sometimes with people who are more analytically minded and, and don't really see that value. What's one way that you can convey, um, you know, the, the importance of storytelling um, uh, to, to someone who needs to be uh, convinced? Yeah, I mean, I think in many ways, some of those, you know, those things that I shared at the end of the presentation to me are the ways that you do that, you know, that, that and, and just if we just take the one about trying to shift people from a competitive positional approach to negotiation to a more collaborative one, um, you know, and in that scenario with my client, I think is a great example of a, a tactic and a tool of, of using a story to do exactly that. And, you know, it's interesting. I do a lot of work um, with very analytical folks as well with a number of uh, people who are engineers. I have um, quite a bit of experience working with engineers over the years and they are incredibly analytical. And, I have noticed that when I say, let me share an example in your world of how this would work. Um, Cause a lot of times I'm talking about with them about dealing with conflict, which for an engineer is often the worst possible thing um, because you know, they're great at uh, working on wastewater treatment plants or big projects where they can apply that thinking, but you put another person in front of them it becomes very anxiety producing. And so part of the way in which I try to teach them is through stories that I've learned over the years of um, how other engineers have solved similar kinds of problems. And so that's why I think the universality kind of notion here is so important because even if you're analytical, you can understand when I say, here's what happened in this case with Bill and can you see the applicability in your situation? And usually the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Wonderful. Um, looking through questions. So we have a question about um, uh, an, an increasing number of um, online platforms mm -hmm. that are being used, um, financial technology, chatbots, would these be impediments to successful negotiation? 
in your um, view? Well, no, I don't think so. Uh, in fact, I think the world um, is moving in a, in a direction where technology um, is, is going to be a core part of negotiation. Um, mm. I actually did a TEDx talk a few years back called The Wired Negotiator on how do you not necessarily see technology as inferior when it comes to negotiation. Uh, but in fact, you know, I find that, for example, for people who negotiate and, and experience a lot of anxiety or pressure, um, email can be a really good vehicle for those kinds of folks. Um, of course, you have to know the limits and the challenges within each technology, but you also, um, but I, I think technology is here to stay. And in fact, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. doing a, uh, a talk with a colleague in a, in a few next month about the role of artificial intelligence and machine learning in negotiation. And then I know PON had done a, a conference um, last year on that very subject. So I think the question is, how do you get comfortable with it? How do you understand what are some of the limits that exist when it comes to technology? And how do you account for that? You know, I think it's like anything. If you're, for example, going to negotiate cross-culturally, you recognize that you have to make some adjustments. You have to understand what that culture is like. Same thing with technology. Yeah, that's great. And we did put a link to that TED Talk in, in, in the chat. So everyone, if you haven't seen it, you can just um, copy that down. Um, we've had questions uh, along the lines of how do you ensure that you're you're creating a good story? How do you craft it, Josh, so that you can make sure that what you're doing is pertinent and has an impact? Yeah. And I would also add to that, how do you select the stories, right? Like you had to pick a finite number of cases, you know, to, to come to the book. What was that process like for you as you were going and, and creating? Yeah, so I actually, you know, to me, I start at the end with what's the lesson that I'm trying to really pull forward. Uh, and then mm -hmm. I will sort of think about, you know, I mean, it's interesting. And in the book, I actually talk about the arc of storytelling, because I think it's important to understand that. And actually, when you look at negotiation, negotiation is actually ideal for storytelling because it, it mirrors the process, you know, that when you sit down, you start by having conversations and, and um, understanding the characters involved in the situation, right? And then often something happens where you get the issues on the table and there's a bit of a, maybe there's a back and forth, maybe there's a, there are conflicting views, maybe there's uncertainty about whether we're gonna be able to make any progress, right? That's sort of the, the apex of the story and every story needs a, a tension point on some level where there's uncertainty. Um, but then, you know, then you end up at a conclusionary point where some kind of creative solution was found to, 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 you know, solve the difficult problem. And I think that when you read the cases, they almost follow that naturally. Um, and, you know, one of the cases, is another colleague of mine, there was a a, a situation between two nonprofit companies who had similar names and it was causing a problem and they were stuck. They, they both neither wanted to engage in a lawsuit, but um, because as nonprofits, they understood and valued the importance of the other's work. Um, and one of the company, one of the organizations had the trademark, but what they were asking of the other wasn't possible, would have put them out of business. And so they went to a mediator and the mediator, so here you have this tension, right, that's built. And they went to the mediator and the mediator flipped the problem on its head and asked a very simple question, which was um, asking the company with the trademark, how important is the name really for you? And would you be willing to give it up if in fact the other entity was able to to find you a new name and pay for that and things along those lines. And it turned out that, that there was a willingness. And so by flipping the problem, by asking a question that nobody had thought to ask, despite the best of intentions, all of a sudden you unlock a box that was closed, right? And now you have a solution that just emerges because people asked the right question and they were thinking, how do we do this differently, right? And I think what you'll find is that a lot of stories, you know, part of the lesson from stories is how do we do this differently? And there is a way and here's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question about um, uh, negotiating through a third party. I, I like this one. Do you have any tips around storytelling, building report with an end client and negotiating when there is a third party involved? 
and the difficulties to establish a counterparty's real interests and building report when mm -hmm. um, when that comes across. Yeah. So by third party, I'm assuming sort of an agent of some. That is what I'm imagining from the way that yes, that it is phrased. Yeah. So it's difficult. Um, because... And we have a number of questions from mediators also. So I think there's how does storytelling fit in when you are, you know, acting as an agent in some capacity? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, you know, in, over the course of my career, I've done a reasonable amount of mediating. And to me, um, I rely on stories a lot as a mediator of, and in particular, I rely on them of uh, similar situations where, you know, people seem to be stuck, it, they think it's hopeless. And you say, well, let me just share with you how another, you know, group was able to manage a similar kind of thing. And again, you're, you know, you're always in negotiation looking for what's possible. And those stories immediately do that. I, I you know, I do think that you lose a little bit of the, um, the sort of delivery. If, you know, if, if I was to say to an agent, hey, can you just convey this story to the other side? Probably not going to come across as, uh, you know, in the same way as if it was something that happened to me and, and I had the ability to do that. So I do think it's difficult. I think that um, when that's the case, I think it's it's perhaps maybe thinking more tangible about, well, let's just make sure that we can get the example across of what we're talking about as opposed to really drawing them into the story through tone and intonation and other kinds of things that you use, you know, when you when you're sharing a story to try to pull the other in. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's also been a number of questions, thank you for that, about how to get others to share their stories themselves. What is the best way to sort of invite, you know, the, the other folks to share more information and, and draw them into storytelling on their own side, which can be a useful tool, of course, in all negotiations. Yeah, I, I honestly, you know, I mean, one of the, the things that I've learned over the years is asking people's advice is, is certainly, um, you know, one of the more effective things to do in negotiation. So, you know, well, what's your advice about how to solve this problem, right? Um, I would simply say to ask them, can you think of an example or a situation that you've previously been in that applies here where you were able to find a solution or something that looks like it, or even the beginnings of something that looks like it? Because again, you're beginning to shift and you're beginning to move them from intransigence to engagement, which is what you want. So, um, you know, and, and I, I don't see any reason why you couldn't simply say, you know, do you happen to, could you share a story of, of, you know, what this might look like, or is there an end goal for you here that we could link back to an example? I think, uh, and it's not really a question that I've asked a lot, but it's making me think that it's probably a good one. Mm -hmm. um, because again, if those are so easily recalled as Jennifer Aker, you know, highlights, they're very likely those stories that are there. And if people are kind of nudged, just like with the inner Agri thing, when somebody was nudged to think about that, it's not, it's, I guess part of it is it's, it, it's not a natural place for a lot of people to go to think of a story to share. But if you open the door and say, you know, I can think of an example, but I'm wondering, you know, is there anything that comes to mind for you? that's transpired over the course of your career that would help here. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, we've had a, a, a number of questions um, around uh, storytelling and also uh, the, the current political climate, which uh, you know I think is probably referring to uh, specifically events in the US, but negotiating and getting and storytelling and sharing with folks who come from vastly different ideologies. Um, any thoughts on, on that or examples? Yeah, actually, I actually think that's one of the best places to do this, because mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're humanizing your experience. And it's very easy for me to say that that those data and that facts that you're presenting are not things I agree with. It's really hard when you tell a story to me about why you believe something or why you hold this perspective on things mm -hmm. for me to deny that. I can't deny it. And that's, in fact, in part of the reason why I wanted to write the book, because you can't deny these stories. They happened. You know, I could I can argue and debate with people about what's the right concept theory approach in negotiation. But when you read a story or when you are humanizing a perspective and letting somebody into sort of um, the the reasoning as to how you got there, that's powerful. That that changes the frame, right? It's hard to argue with that. 
Um, and, and frankly, that's the beginning. You know, I, a lot of times people say, what do we do in this kind of situation? And I wish I had a lot of answers, but one of the things, one answer I do have is don't go into those conversations or those negotiations trying to change the other person's mind. Because mm -hmm. if that's the goal of the conversation, you're not gonna get there. Mm -hmm. But if I tell you a good story, that leads you to change your own mind which is really what negotiation is about. We, we can't change other people's minds. They, cho they choose to change their own mind because of what we've said, because of the, the persuasive tactics or the persuasive stories we've shared. So I actually think we should be thinking a lot more to stories um, when things get difficult and not so much the factual based cases that we can make. Yeah. We've had a lot of questions and comments about emotions and hostility and stories. And it sounds like what you're saying is that this is sort of the perfect remedy to, to change a mindset um, in, in these kinds of situations. I think so. And I think it's, it's, it's a way to do it um, that almost immediately engages the other. It, it, you know, it's, I find that we simply um, stay open. When somebody says, I've got a story to tell you, I'm curious, I'm intrigued, much more so than here's what's wrong with all of what you just said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we had a question about the, the organization of the types of stories and it's probably gonna be one of the last ones that we get to um, sure. uh, because uh, of course in your book, you organize things through the corporate lens and then uh, through the, the public sector and daily life lens. Is there a difference in the approach and the use of storytelling in those environments that, that you find? Um, I don't. I don't think there's a huge difference. I mean, I you know, in many ways, and again, um, you know, the the interest based approach to negotiation as well. Um, you know, you can see that strewn throughout these cases. You know, to me, building rapport is about the interest based approach to negotiation in a crisis negotiation, right? So, um, I, you know, without question, you're going to modify, you're going to change how you approach a conversation, um, whether it's in the business world or what. But but um, no, I think that's the thing that's so interesting about this is it's it's universal. And so, you know, it you can start down a road and somebody might wonder where you're going with it, but that that universality sort of takes over and and it transports people to a place where they can they can hear this. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Well, this is so great. Um, we've had a number of questions about resources. Um, so we did put uh, links to certain things in the chat, but I will say that you know, on um, the program on negotiation website. There are a variety of resources from other reading materials, different talks, recordings of previous events that we've hosted on, on different topics on negotiations. This recording will be made uh, available for all of you in a couple of days, as well as the slides um, that Josh showed. So please do continue to engage with us. We're also holding a number of upcoming executive education trainings in the coming months, uh, all virtual for now, but uh, if you have interested People, we would be delighted to have you among our participants. Thank you to the nearly 450 people who joined us today. And mostly, thank you to you, Josh Weiss, for, uh, for everything. And congratulations on your book. I encourage everyone to go out and get a copy and, uh, and to continue to, uh, to engage with the program of negotiation with all of us. So thank you so much and have a great afternoon, evening, whatever time of day it is for you. We'll let you leave now and uh, have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Nicole.